we're in this period when monetary policy has tightened a bit more to go and we know it eventually 100% is going to succeed in suppressing inflation and then interest rates can come back down again but we don't have enough evidence as yet so it's all about wondering is is are the high interest rates getting traction yes show me the evidence of that traction being gained you know that the the, the spinning of the wheels is stopping and you know things are moving moving forward welcome back to tea with tony it feels a bit like the economy has gone from being in a mild storm state to that of cyclone pending, complete with precursor winds that continue to hurt Kiwis from the petrol pump to the grocery aisle. We asked Tony if it's too late to batten down the hatches, and in doing so get his view on the inflation interest rate equation, the housing market, and the not so mysterious case of missing Kiwis, and why that even matters. Hey Tony, how are ya? Good thanks Lenska, good, good to be online again. Yeah, nice to see you. Um, Look, let's start with the big hairy cyclone in the room. Um, look, are we in a direct course of a nasty cyclone, economically speaking? I don't think so, really. As I've pointed out before, the Kiwi dollar is relatively low, so that's good for export receipts for the country. We've got foreign tourists determined to go, well, basically anywhere outside their own country, so we're heading overseas, but lots of people look like they're heading our way, and certainly the cruise ships have been uh, buzzing around the country there. More foreign students going to be showing up from uh, next year is a positive, and of course uh, a few more migrants uh, as well able to get into the uh, country. The government's accounts are looking pretty good, so I think in an election year um, there's going to be some sort of an easing of fiscal policy and we've already seen a little bit of that with the uh, early childcare subsidies for instance being raised uh, by the uh, by the government and so yeah, also good international prices for the stuff we ship overseas I mean it's not a beautiful picture overseas you know there's a good chance of a, of a world recession but I think New Zealand is relatively well placed and I don't believe we have a recession but if we do I think it'll be a reasonably mild one but the unemployment rate will go up a little bit I mean that's certainly what monetary policy is explicitly um, aiming at. So what you're saying really is that it, it might be more of a bit more pain for a bit longer than we originally thought perhaps? <laughs> Uh, let's see. The pain, of course, for many businesses isn't from a lack of customers. That, that's how we're used to thinking about an economy. If the economy is in bad shape, it is because there are not enough customers. Whereas uh, for most businesses in New Zealand, quite frankly, it is not because uh, of not enough customers. It's because of not enough staff. We are a capacity constrained um, economy. And that's where the challenge lies for businesses to, to stop just moaning about this situation and, and wondering, you know, are they going to find the people that they want and trying to do it. Adjusting their businesses, focusing on their most profitable products or clients, location, production, distribution methods, giving a lot more thought to more efficiently using the labour resource that is available. That's what I stress in pretty much all my talks uh, these days. That's where the challenge lies for business. So even uh, as we see the world economy getting a bit worse, well, quite frankly, um, that can be sort of helpful for New Zealand, buy a little bit of time for some businesses to to get their uh, uh, sort of structure um, in order there. And of course, we have to remember, the Reserve Bank is explicitly trying to slow the economy down. So one of the worst things that could happen here would be uh, somebody like me pops up and say, boy, the outlook is really great. There's strong demand mm. for everything we make out there. Jobs demand is great, you know. Uh, well, of course, that just means higher inflation and higher interest rates. And the housing market is sort of the point of the spear when it comes to the impact, um, certainly in the short term, um, of interest rates going up. But isn't it with the higher rates and um, higher inflation that, that what the Reserve Bank is trying to do is to slow everything down, as you say, and that will bite at some point and kind of quell, quell demand, so, so to speak? Yes, yeah, monetary policy, it's always going to work. Uh, every single tightening cycle, you, you can be 100% certain inflation will be defeated. But what we obviously, as we've just proven again, don't know is how high will interest rates need to go in order to get this cycle's inflation down. And as thankfully I've been pointing out for quite some time, we haven't had a tightening cycle in New Zealand of proper duration since 2004 through to 2007. And uh, most of what we do these days is quite different from what it was one and a half decades 
decades ago. Mm. So mm. we definitely are not certain here in New Zealand, Australia, uh, uh, United States of you know, where do interest rates need to go? How high? How long do they stay there? When do they start coming down um, again? Hence me jumping up and down like a fool a year and a half ago saying lock in for five years at 2.99% or, or thereabouts. And you really don't have to worry about this massive period um, of uncertainty. So, so yeah, that was just basically blowing the trumpet a little bit again. That, that's over and done with. <laughs> We've we've heard the the two point nine nine things a few times, haven't we, people? But no, that's fine. It, it, and it, look, it's a fair point. So in terms of inflation and interest rates, let's go there. We had um, surprise data come out in October that with inflation being quite a bit higher than everyone was predicting. Talk us through that, and and, and you know and back to basics and uh, uh, what that meant for interest rates and, and where that's taking us potentially, bearing in mind, as we always say, and as you just rightly pointed out, um, no one can get it right. And, and um, we've, we've been proven wrong quite a few times. So um, talk us through it, though, Tony. Yes, yeah, such as the world we live in. Yes, when the inflation number came out, um, the expectation in the market was maybe 6.5% annual rate down from 7.3. Well, of course, it came in at 7.2%. So goodness me, 0.7% higher than expected is unusual. Now, about half of that difference we can attribute excuse me, to international airfares being higher uh, than was basically assumed. We don't have sort of a week-to-week or month-to-month gauge on what those airfares are, and so that was new information that had to be factored into the uh, uh, mix, and hopefully there's going to be a pullback in those airfares once we get you know, more capacity, especially uh, across the Tasman um, in New Zealand. So that was part of the surprise, and when you strip out special things, the actual error wasn't 0.7, it was maybe 0.3%, but regardless inflation uncomfortably high and that I think was very important because it said to banks who had been watching their borrowing costs go up and up and up but they'd be leaving their fixed rates sort of steady not changing them and the margins were getting smaller and smaller the signal of the high inflation number to banks was uh, these borrowing costs are not going to suddenly blip down they're going to a stay up probably go higher it's time to definitely increase the mortgage rate. So three weeks or so ago, we had about half a percent, let's say, go on to the fixed mortgage rates uh, out there. And uh, that's definitely had an impact we can already see in the uh, residential real estate market. And you know, some of that is eventually going to feed through to uh, lower consumer spending as well. Something I can see, well, all of those things I can see in uh, my surveys. And we're definitely seeing it with our clients that are coming off quite low rates. And, you know, it's it's a bit like of a shock, um, even though you know it's coming. So that kind of getting good advice and working through a plan discussion we have every month, I cannot stress it enough. I think I mentioned last month one of our business owners talks about wake up, shake up and take back control. And um, I think an environment like this is a great line. Um, an environment like this is, is a really good opportunity to not just reset for today and tomorrow, but for the long-term future. Um, because as you say, Tony, you can't always predict the rates. What you can you can manage is, is your own behaviour. So, um, and that's not denigrating from people that are probably struggling. I think there's a lot of people at the moment that are struggling, genuinely so. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a balance and it's about looking at what you've got and, and, and getting the right advice. What, 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 what it's very much about when these events coming al- come along is understanding what your risk tolerance really is. There's a lesson in, in here for all of us. When we get these rates to six, six and a half percent, people realise, you know, we, when people were talking about that, I wasn't worried, but now it's here. I think I am worried. Well, that needs to be factored in for the next few years when a person is thinking about their exposure to, you know, interest rates. And maybe that's why, although personally, I'm still pretty much a fan of the one year and maybe a bit mm-hmm. in two years out there in the marketplace, people have definitely moved into fixing in the two year period uh, now. It's not always the cheapest rate. Uh, out there, but people are now deciding a bit more certainty. I, I'm not willing to take the risk that the Reserve Bank really has to throw the hammer down and push interest rates to some silly levels there. So yeah, people have learned something, and so they're going out a little bit further along the yield curve there. And like I say, looking mainly at the two year, not so much three year. Two year is basically it for most people, it seems at the moment. Yeah, and that always comes back to your personal circumstances and working through a plan that suits you. And our advisors do a lot of that. It's, it's well, what are your goals? What, what do you want to achieve in that period? And for some people, it's writing the ship. For others, it's putting a new kitchen in. But you, you, you structure yourself 
around those things, not the other way around. Um, okay, Tony, so you mentioned to me earlier in an email actually about the overall management of monetary policy and we don't we don't get into this in depth very often but you know it's been i think there was a reserve bank review that was published um all the highlights of which was published this week um it's been a pretty rough ride in terms of monetary policy and the broader environment what's your take yeah, well, the Reserve Bank unfortunately has a history of not getting monetary policy right. They tightened monetary policy much too slowly over 2004 into 2007, and uh, they've pretty much done the same thing in a shorter period of time for 2021. Now, they should have been raising interest rates earlier in the year, pulling back on special lending programs, um, etc. All we can say is that uh, when you look at central banks around the world, our Reserve Bank was actually just about the least bad. But at least they they're not increasing rates quite as rapidly as the huge catch-up having to be done by these central banks um, overseas. That so They were just so far behind the ball this year. So we, we're looking at a peak of the OCR estimate at around 5%. Is that your kind of, ta- your kind of thinking? We may as well go for that. The markets are pricing in 5.5%. I mean, seriously, not a single person on this planet can stand up there in front of an audience and say, oh, I've got my interest rate forecast right. Everybody has underestimated the inflationary pressures out there. Everybody's underestimated how high interest rates need to go. And that's, however, where this past month or so is very interesting. And I've written one or two articles about this. You see, we economists in the markets, we've all got sick of revising our numbers upward. We, we find it a bit embarrassing. So when New Zealand's high inflation number came out the other day, it's like the unspoken collective decision was, blow this for a joke, let's get right ahead of the pack here and let's increase our interest rate forecast by maybe a percent. And surely we are never have to, uh, gonna have to revise those upward again. And so there's a risk that in the financial markets they're actually pricing in too much of a tightening. And so yeah, Lenska, when you say you know 5%, I think maybe we could get there Uh, but the markets are pricing in 5.5 which I think is is too far and that's why you see I'm still a bit on the if I were borrowing I'd be mainly one year fixed and 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 some at the two years because I think at some point in 2023 let's let's have a guess at the middle of the year the markets will be of the view you know monetary policy definitely looks like it's doing its job they're not going to have to tighten quite as much as we were thinking and when that happens you'll get the medium to longer term interest rates um, moving downwards sort of five, four, three into the two year uh, periods there. And then the shorter term rates following uh, late 23 over 2024. 20, um, so the OCR or the central bank, R- RBNZ, they pull the inflate, the OCR trigger, the interest rate trigger to try and get inflation under control. Tony, jump in any time you like. And what that means is when they pull that trigger, we have to manage the inflation, there's a period where both of them are high, and that's what we're feeling right now, and it's starting to hurt. So, Tony, in terms of inflation, when do you think those higher interest rates are going to kick that inflation to the curb? We're in this period when monetary policy has tightened, a bit more to go, and we know it eventually 100% is going to succeed in suppressing inflation, and then interest rates can come back down again. But we don't have enough evidence as yet. So it's all about wondering, is, is are the high interest rates getting traction? Yes, show me the evidence of that traction being gained, you know, that the, the, the spinning of the wheels is stopping and you know things are moving, moving forward. Well, I can see it in my surveys in that with this most recent round of increases in uh, uh, fixed mortgage rates by about half a percent, I can see that the investors in my surveys of real estate agents, uh, people generally, and mortgage advisors, they've run for the hills. I mean, they were already, you know, sort of stuck in there anyway since March 23 tax changes last year. They were starting to poke their heads out. No, they've scarpered right back into the darkness again. The first home buyers, they have just gone, oh, let's just wait a bit and see what happens. So the first home buyers are most definitely in the market. And what I would say to first home buyers is, is this is an interesting period for yourselves because you have the investors, they're way back there. And the owner occupiers, um, I can get some insight into whether they're willing to sell and buy, buy yet from one of my surveys. No, they're still waiting to see how things pan out. So it's like 
the market is open slather for first home buyers to go in there, do some picking and choosing from listings being up 72% from a year ago. The vendors are more willing to uh, negotiate than as each month goes by, basically. This is an unusual opportunity for first home buyers to secure a purchase. Don't worry about trying to pick the bottom. I really haven't got the foggiest when it's going to occur. No one has a history of successfully you know, picking this period of time and just concentrate on, you know, uh, uh, you're going to be in the place 10, 20, 30 years, get the debt level down over time, um, etc. So, yeah, the housing market, I think, is, is quite interestingly in favour for uh, for the first home buyers at the moment. And just keep in mind also, the banks, it's like as each, let's say, month goes by, they're more comfortable with the Credit Contracts Consumer Finance Act. They're more comfortable with maybe taking one or two more risks out there. The lending criteria are bit by bit. It's sort of uh, uh, two steps forward, half a step back sometimes mm. in terms of the credit availability, it is slowly moving in, in favour there. But it's still going to be quite some time, let's say six, nine months before I think we can definitively go. Monetary policy definitely does it, done its thing. Thank goodness for that. We're not back in the 1970s, 80s again. We're heading back towards 2%. We're still some months away. And while we're in this phase, the interest rates in the wholesale market, you know, they're going to be up and down like this, something wicked for quite some time. What's happening with housing in terms of house values? Uh, you've got a good sense of this, I know. And I believe Queenstown is holding its own. That's where I live, by the way. And that's about all. Is that true? Yeah, well, Queenstown's interesting because we saw such economic devastation from the borders being closed and sort of second ranking there would be Rotorua, um, um, obviously. Um, but it's also in Queenstown that I got the very, very first indication that the real estate market would have some strength when during the first lockdown, seven weeks, 2020, the first feedback I got from real estate agents, they were saying to me, they've had some wealthier people on the phone to them saying, if you've got some distressed sellers, let me know. I want to make a purchase. And that was the first indication. That, that was my on, husband, so... I think, that sent you email. <laughs> <laughs> and I, thought, I thought that was so so interesting. Now, people need to be aware, there are many measures of house price changes available in New Zealand. Uh, core logic, each of them has re- got good advantages, great in their own way, core logic, quotable value New Zealand, trade me, R-E-I-I-N-Z. So basically for me, it's a case of pick one, otherwise I'm going to be talking inflation numbers and housing sort of every week, it's going to be ridiculous. So I only look at the R-E-I-N-Z uh, house price indexes, which are adjusted for changes in the mix of things sold from month um, um, to month and they're pretty much the most up-to-date gauge on what is happening with prices in the marketplace. A lot of the other ones are actually averages for three-month periods. They'll say the month of October. Actually, it's the average of, what's that, August, September, October that they're talking about. Now, what I can see, of course, is what we all saw uh, three or so weeks ago, house prices fell 0.7% in September, uh, but the previous month, uh, they'd fallen about 1.3%, before that 1.4%, and then it was 2 2. 1% or so in the two months before that. House prices are still falling. They are falling, however, at a decreasing pace. Now, I don't think we're suddenly straight lining to, uh, oh, no change for October. I think they still go down for a few more months. But I'm still happy with my comment from three to four months ago that we're in the end game for the period of house price falls. It means they still fall further. But it means we're just getting closer to the uh, to the bottom in the market, and the falls will come at a decreasing pace. And it's sort of like a message there of yeah, you're taking a bit of a punt if you're going to be waiting for the bottom of the market because look at the situation in New Zealand. We've got a period of I call it economic challenge rather than recession. In periods of economic challenge that I've lived through since the 1970s, I have never before seen the labour market this strong. And basically giving people an ability to keep servicing their existing mortgage and keep in their minds, I want to buy my first house. I want to upgrade. So one of my theories is this. Once we actually get a bit of a sign of the inflation's beating, we've seen the worst of the interest rates, I actually think there's there's the backlog of people building up, getting longer and longer, and they're going to step into the market and look to make their purchase. And we could get you know relatively quick increase in sales. Prices not necessarily, but the key thing is the listings could fall away relatively quickly. At the moment, 72% up from a year earlier. You know that could change relatively quickly. I think some autumn, winter next year. That's that's my best guess for that sort of turning in the cycle. That brings us to our missing Kiwis. I, I, I referenced them in the intro and you've been referencing them a lot in the last couple of weeks is, do we have a population deficit, Mr. Alexander? What's going on? 
Yeah, well, uh, Statistics New Zealand, they released their um, sort of regional and local council level population estimates for the June quarter uh, of this year, uh, just uh, two or three weeks ago. And, uh, and I looked at those numbers and I thought, I can see where there's been population increases and decreases. Can we make a reasonable stab at what the population for an area, you know, why Matty, why Taki, you know, Christchurch City, would have been without pandemic? So in order to make that estimate, you've got to make some assumptions. So go ahead, make your own assumptions. I simply looked at what was the average rate of population growth for each local authority area in New Zealand in the previous 20 years, I think I used. And if that had continued for the past three years, what would populations be now? And where were they? Uh, in fact, in June this year. Well, here's Queenstown with, I think it was about 4,000 people fewer or something like, like that. Um, the, the assumptions would have said, oh, it was here, but it was here. The biggest one, of course, was Auckland, 71,000 fewer people than one would have expected with, uh, based on those, you know, the long-term um, population uh, 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 growth rate. And so that, I think, helps account for why, in the context of a big surge in new townhouses, apartments going up in Auckland, we we do have an extra fall in prices there of about 17%, whereas outside of Auckland, the fall around the country is about 9%, 8 or 9% um, or so. Uh, and the high visibility of the extra supply in Auckland um, coming forward uh, as, uh, as, as well. Righty-ho, anything else to add, Mr Alexander? Okay, let's see. I, I, I just want to emphasise the uncertainty is going to remain out there for many months longer regarding interest rates, where they peak, how long they stay up and when they come, come down again. So people need to keep that um, in mind. Remember that uh, we have this unique feature of uh, tight labour market in New Zealand and that's going to mean people are going to remain interested in purchasing a, a property uh, and we've got the low Kiwi dollar and generally good prices for what we export overseas. Having said that, um, China is looking quite uh, at quite a bit of a slowdown so that's going to hit our forestry sector so we'll keep that in mind. But you know, I could sit here for the next 10 or 15 minutes and run through a list of negative things for New Zealand, positive things for the economic outlook as I've been doing for you know, three and a half decades and give you a forecast of how far the economy, how much the economy will grow. Doesn't matter. Whatever number I come out with, it doesn't really matter. Overlying it all is the Reserve Bank. They will do whatever it takes to slow down growth, to force businesses to slow down their passing through of cost increases into higher selling uh, uh, prices. So even if I said, you know, the outlook for New Zealand is really, really positive, I couldn't say it. That would just mean the Reserve Bank would have to take interest rates are even higher. So strange as it may sound, partly the most positive thing for the New Zealand economy would be if we had sort of some negative growth numbers in the very near future. It would limit the extra upside on interest rates. So that's the strange world of economics in a capacity constrained economy, which is what we've got now in New Zealand. Look, thanks, Tony, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, as I always say, Tony is an independent economist. We like it that way. His views are not necessarily those of NZ HL and vice versa. Um, do do ask us any questions. Um, we will do. We will endeavour to do a Christmas wrap up before Christmas. Quite kind of. We might do something like mapping out the year because it has been an interesting year, Tony. Um, mm -hmm. And then you'll see us again next year. But so we'll endeavour to get me and Tony in the same kind of space and uh, get something done before Christmas. Thanks a lot, everyone. See you later. Thanks very much. Bye bye.